Welcome. It's a wonderful time to be at the University of Connecticut. This is where we are right now, Next Generation Hall. It was made possible by uh, the governor and the legislature who have supported the university so well. So it's a gorgeous dorm, um, and the campus, I think, looks wonderful. The best indicator of a university's success is the number of applications it's getting for places in the undergraduate freshman class. Not only do we get a record number of applications this year yet again, about 36,000 applications for about 3,800 seats on the Storrs campus, we are getting wonderful students who are um, salutatorians, valedictorians, extremely ambitious, successful in their high school careers. And this is one of the most diverse classes we've had yet, and that's a goal of ours too, to keep diversifying the student body. We do very well already, but we can do much, much better. We're also having great success in recruiting faculty. As many faculty open lines as we have, we're finding extremely high quality people from around the world. So I'm thrilled to be here after about five and a half years. Um, it's been a real honor and a pleasure to serve at the university, to serve with a terrific governor, legislature, and of course our board of trustees that is always out there advocating for us and protecting us. So would love to take questions. Hi, my name is Megan Ambrose. I work for the facilities department in the water pollution control facility. So my question to you is, given the state's huge deficit and given the plans that UConn has to create more infrastructure and recruit more students and build more dorms, what is the plan of action timeline for some earmarking of dollars to provide the infrastructure needed to accommodate all of the upcoming projects? Our appropriations have been cut. I mean, there's no question about it. By the tens of millions, um, we've had to cut back. Our faculty hiring has been slower than we hoped it would be, and that's, that's very important because if faculty hiring is slower than it should be, then we can't produce as much research as we would like. Some of our class sizes get bigger. Students can't always get the classes they need when they need them. So the state appropriations cuts do hurt. Uh, but we try to make up for that. We try to find ways to increase our revenue through the health center, through athletics, through the different parts of the university that can generate revenue. Uh, we can do better on fundraising. That will also help to make up for cuts in state appropriations. But the Connecticut economy needs to turn back to where it was to get stronger so that they can keep funding us to the level we need. Um, so the question was asked not though about operations money, which is what I think about most of the time, um, because that's the money that we use for student scholarships and for hiring faculty, for doing programming. Uh, so it's vitally important. You don't want your operating budget cut, and that's what we've seen in the last few years. Much less worrisome is capital. Uh, that's the money that you use to build buildings and facilities. There, we've done incredibly well. And those of you who are out at Farmington, um, at UConn Health have seen it with our new hospital tower, ambulatory care center. The rest of the university has received a lot of money from the state, again, for facilities projects, um, including, of course, Next Generation Connecticut, which was a $1.5 billion investment in the university. So it's not glamorous stuff, but we need to do it uh, to be good stewards of the state property. Hello, my Hi. name is Odia Kane. I'm a sophomore. So about diversifying this campus and seeing that this class has been the most diverse since ever. And I wanted just to know what was UConn's plans in terms of programs and infrastructures around the university to support these students mm -hmm. because they are coming from different backgrounds that may be more challenged when they come to the university. I think that's an excellent question. So we have our diversity numbers, our numbers that I think any university president will be proud of. We're not completely satisfied with them. We think we can still do better in diversifying the uh, incoming freshman classes, but a lot to be proud of there. You're, you're right though, that once the students come here from all different backgrounds and not forgetting our international students coming from around the world, uh, we need to support them and figure out you know, where they're coming from, what kind of challenges they face that are unique and special. So one of the most important things we've done, um, I think overdue for all the universities in the country, um, we're out there and have been successful in finding a great person, is to hire a chief diversity officer. So uh, we have one, she was uh, hired back in the spring in a very competitive interview process. Uh, her name is Joelle Murchison and she is our first ever chief diversity officer for the university. She reports directly to me 
And um, her job is just this, to make sure that the diverse students that we have, as well as the larger population, are really supported with the kind of programming they need to be successful. Uh, we have a very high retention rate for minority students and, and non-minority students, but also that could be better. And students, it's not just about staying at school, they need to be comfortable and happy here. Um, I'm looking at uh, uh, someone who started one of our very best programs with regard to diversity, um, and that's our Scholars 2 program. And the Scholars House is um, part of a floor uh, devoted to African American male students. Um, it's open to a broader uh, student body, but it is focused on African American men and how they can succeed in college. So we hope to have more learning communities like that that are focused on specific populations, their needs, their anxieties, their concerns, and make sure that they're successful here. So it's a model program in the country. We've gotten a lot of great attention for it. We've gotten a lot of challenges to it, and we are happy to not only defend it, but brag about it as a way to keep our diverse students here. Hello, I am Dan Bird. I'm a senior political science student and president of the undergraduate student government. What is the university's long-term plan for the endowment? We're so dependent on the state because of the size of our endowment. So what's the long-term plan to get that endowment up to size so that we can depend less on the state and that we'll have more certain revenue sources? We can't make excuses anymore. We have tremendously successful donors out there. We need to ask them for money. We need to ask them for support, for their expertise. And so again, that's what I spend a huge amount of time on. Uh, a couple of years after I got here, we hired a new chief fundraiser, and he is head of the Yukon Foundation, which is a different organization than Yukon, but is built to support the university. So it's our fundraising arm. And uh, of course, I work very closely with the president there. Um, his name is Josh Newton. And since he's come here, we have accelerated our fundraising. It does, you have to put in money on the front end to raise money. We have to hire development officers, you have to have events, you have to have the president out traveling. Um, so the last few years we have raised around $80 million a year for, uh, for our yearly or annual giving and a lot of that money goes into the endowment. You know, the first goal would be to get to a billion dollars and we're still, we're a long way from that. It's going to take a while but it's one of those projects, building endowments that, that never stops. Uh, even the wealthiest universities in the country, their presidents are out fundraising a huge majority of their time because that money really does protect the university when it's a public university from a lot of these um, state appropriation cuts. And for the publics and the privates, just gives the university some insulation for the long term against economic downturns and to be able to support faculty, students, staff, the education and, and research mission. Hi, my name is Erin Melton. I'm a professor in the Department of Public Policy. Just wanted to see if you could talk a little bit about your vision for the new downtown Hartford campus, um, how you see the campus being integrated into the downtown Hartford community. What are your expectations for um, the vibrance that uh, we will bring to that area? The downtown campus in Hartford, moving our west campus, our west to Hartford campus to downtown, I think is one of the very best things that we'll do in our time. Um, we are long overdue helping the city of Hartford. We are taking the Hartford Times building, as a lot of you know, we are building that out. It is going to be absolutely gorgeous. It will open next summer. Uh, we will be bringing thousands of faculty, students, and staff to downtown Hartford every single day. And there will be, as they, as they say in urban planning, a lot of feet on the street. We built this campus uh, purposefully, intentionally, um, to not be some kind of an enclosure where people come, you know, they park, they run in, they take their classes, they teach, and then they leave. We built it so that it doesn't have food service, for example. So if you want to eat and you're downtown, um, you've got to leave the building, you've got to go out um, and find something to eat at the many restaurants, cafes that are around the campus right now, and more will be coming um, in the near future. So it is built to be an integrated part of that, that area of Hartford. I think we picked an amazing location. We already have the Wadsworth Athenaeum. That was a very big draw for us. We have the, um, the public library, which has a been a great partner for us. We were helping to build out parts of the Hartford Public Library so that we could share that library with the public. 
and also Barnes & Noble, which has taken over our bookstore operations across all campuses, will be building a downtown bookstore right near the Hartford campus, you know, within very, very close walking distance. It's been a very long time since the city of Hartford has had a big bookstore. Um, so that's another thing that we're bringing um, because we're coming down there with our faculty, staff, and students. So I think we'll be fully integrated uh, into the city of Hartford, and that was our goal. Thank you. I'm Lucy Gilson. I'm a management faculty member in the business school. Um, I wanted to follow up on the question about being an uh, economic engine for the state. So we're hearing that the state is struggling, and yet we position ourselves as being part of the economic engine that's going to help that. Can you talk about some specific initiatives um, that are designed to help the state from UConn's perspective? Sure. Um, well, one of the, the one, and I, I'll mention this because we happen to be in this next generation Connecticut dorm, um, is 3D manufacturing and advanced manufacturing. So that's an area um, that the state of Connecticut has, has long been committed to. You know, back before there were really a lot of interdisciplinary scientific programs, um, they, they developed here the Institute for Material Sciences, which is still alive and doing incredibly well here at UConn. So that's one example, that's one area um, that the state has invested in us through Next Generation Connecticut, where we hope to invent and start companies and bring in federal grants, which again have a multiplier effect in the state economy because you're hiring people and you're bringing in new funds from outside. So advanced manufacturing, genetics and genomics, um, I think one of our big success stories over the last few years is attracting Jackson Labs. So Jackson Labs is a, um, uh, a company that uh, produces genetically altered mice for scientific experimentation. A few years ago, thanks to the governor, the legislature, and a lot of our scientists here, we were able to attract Jackson Labs research arm to Farmington. Their building is up, they have hundreds of people working there, they work with our scientists, and the goal is, of course, to cure disease. That's what we do over at UConn Health, um, but also to invent, to bring in federal grants, to, um, to start companies, and to try to contribute uh, the kinds of technologies that will help people to live longer. Digital media. It's one of, of course, the fastest growing areas in the American economy. And here at UConn, we have very talented faculty, have put up the facilities we need to train our students in digital media so they can go out into the world. There are so many jobs open in that field um, because it's one of the big parts of the future. Hi, my name is Basim Gade, and I'm a second year dental student from UConn Health. And uh, my question is, do you think the recent state budget cuts will impact UConn in terms of ranking? We have been in the top 25 for, for many years now. I think we'll stay there. Um, all co most colleges and universities move up and down a couple of notches, and that's not really important. What's important is the overall trajectory. And to be firmly in the top 25 for the last few years is really a testament, especially to the faculty and um, the staff here who have made for so much student success. Um, there are those rankings of universities more broadly, but have to do with undergraduate indicators of success. Um, there are also professional school rankings. So for example, the dental school um, has its ranking, the medical school and the law school. Um, we do the best we can to keep climbing in those. A lot of it is about resources. So it's, it's not a, a beauty contest that we want to win. We don't want to be high in rankings just to say we're high in rankings. We actually want to be a high quality place. And very important for somebody like you who's a dental student who is in a professional school, we want to make sure that um, you are able to find the right job for you in the right part of the country where you want to be. And that's something that the, the rankings all the, have a lot of trouble with. Um, there is a ranking that we do very well in. It's done by Money Magazine, and it's about a college or university's value. And it takes into account academic quality, but also um, how much financial aid the university is giving out and, um, and retention rates, things like that. In that kind of ranking, we do incredibly well. So I'm really happy about that ranking and being high in it in that it looks at starting salaries when students leave the university. So that's something that the US News and World Report doesn't capture, but other rankings do. Hi, my name is Dhruv Shah. I am a molecular cell bio sophomore, and I am representing the STEM scholars community. I had a question about the, the great funding in STEM 
how is the graduate student job outlook improved and what steps are being taken to measure that? Graduate student success is a, is a, is a particular kind of thing that is usually measured by schools and departments. In it feels like engineering and science, people go into industry, but they all and they become entrepreneurs. Um, but they also take tenure track jobs at universities or they teach. Um, so we do all of those things, and most of our graduate programs, you know, students go off to different kinds of careers. Um, but I think you got to look at that department by department. And and we place students incredibly well, from what I gather. We train students in, in science, technology, math, but to what end? We still need philosophy. We still need. Um, people to be able to write, to think, to analyze. And so, uh, you know, we can't have people inventing things but not knowing not why, not knowing what it should add to culture, to public policy, to um, the advancement of America and the world. Um, can I just uh, say something more about the humanities, which I've been trying to, to talk about here, because I do think they get uh, less play than, um, than the STEM fields. STEM just takes a lot of money. That's why it gets so much attention. You're, yes, they invent, but you know, philosophers and English professors and political scientists, they have great contributions to make to the world also. Um, sure enough, one of our philosophers, um, Michael Lynch, has brought in one of the biggest grants that we've had to the university in years. So I, I see it as everybody contributing to STEM um, and to, to that mission uh, that is, that's critical for the Connecticut economy. But, um, in their own ways, and, and I think it's part of what makes the university um, such a wonderful interdisciplinary place. Hello, my name is Drake Lopez. Um, I'm an undergraduate junior uh, with a major in molecular and cell biology um, on the pre-med track. Um, I'm very fortunate to represent the Student Support Services Program. You know, I'm a student who's first generation, low income, from an underrepresented background, and what that program has done for me is more than I could ever think for. Are there any plans to match other scholarships or even provide more scholarships for students um, who still need that high financial need? Absolutely, this is our highest fundraising priority, actually. So I'm glad you asked that. And it, it, it dovetails with Daniel's question earlier about building the endowment. The number one priority of the University of the Yukon Foundation is and has been for the last couple of years student scholarships. Um, undergraduate and graduate. So when we find donors who are, are new to us or donors who have already been giving to the university, what we've been trying to do is move them toward greater giving in the area of student scholarships. It's number one. Because without a terrific student body to match our talented faculty, you know, we're not going anywhere. Um, there are a lot of students in need, but by no means have we taken care of all the students and all their financial needs. I don't think many universities are close to that, but we try every day. I find, and I know that a lot of our donors find, that this is the most viscerally rewarding gift that you can give to a university. Um, so we try to steer people toward that. Um, bigger is better. <laughs> we like endowed student scholarships best, but um, we will take any amount that people are willing to give because helping a student who can't afford to go to the university come to the university, that's about the best thing you can do. So thanks everybody.